Now I'm going to read um, a second extract from my, the short story, What Would Scarlet O'Hara Do? Based on, as I said in the previous extract, in the 20s and 30s and 40s and into the 50s, many people modelled themselves on their favourite film stars. In this case, it was the classic film, um, Gone with the Wind, Vivian Lee played the glorious, beautiful Vivian Lee played the Scarlet. So here we are, Muriel, um, who thinks herself as an off-screen Scarlet O'Hara. Okay, on with the glasses. She just uh, met Frank again, uh, and he's been very cool to her the previous day, and she wakes up the following morning confused. Would you like to go for a walk, Frank asked as they were leaving the church after Sunday service. All right, surprised. Muriel forced herself to sound casual. I don't feel you have to. I don't feel I have to, she said with as much dignity as she could muster. I feel like a walk. We could go down by the stream. I'd rather go to the hay barn. Damn cheek, he was smirking at her. She glared at him. And second thoughts, I'd better help at lunch. My sister's there. That doesn't have to help me from helping too. But that Muriel swept out through the church lich gate and walked quickly down the road to join the others. After lunch, Bob suggested they all walk to our club for a swim. But Peggy said the beach would be too crowded. Let's go to that place by the river we found last year, she said. Want to come, Frank? Frank glanced, uh, glanced at Muriel, but she pretended not to notice. I don't know, he said. But he went all the same. Nice rock, he remarked, after Peggy and Bob disappeared into the forest, leaving two of them sitting on the riverbank. Did you miss me? Why should I? She replied with a toss mm -hmm. of the head. Not after what happened last year. Nothing happened last year. She tossed her head with, uh, in a Scarlet O'Hara manner, manner. Aren't you going to give me a kiss? He leaned forward, but she pushed him away. You've changed, she said. The war has changed everyone, he said thoughtfully. I liked you better as you were, she murmured, looking down at the grass. Come on, give us a kiss before the others get back. I said no, she snapped. I was only asking for a kiss. Any girl would give more than a kiss, he added teasingly. Well, you're not in England now, Muriel said, and got up and started throwing stones into the river, but he remained sitting on the riverbank. The war has changed everything, he said wistfully. You've already given that excuse. Things have may have changed in England, but not here. Just as well I'm going back, so just as well you are. Muriel s stared at the slow flowing water, forcing back tears. People arrived at the party shortly after high tea and soon the farmhouse was packed to overflowing, all impatient for the dancing and fun to begin. And it did once the accordionist arrived. Muriel made a show of helping Mrs. Byrne so, so as to avoid dancing with Frank. But she needn't have bothered, for he danced with every girl within reach. Show off, she muttered to herself. Still mad at me? Frank came over her at last. She refused in her imagined Scarlet O'Hara haughty manner. Come on, he smiled his red butler smile. We'll sit this one out and you can tell me what you've been up to while I'm away. She allowed herself to be led by her hand into the drawing room. It was full of chattering groups. They sat outside on the kitchen steps. So what have you been up to? Lots of boyfriends, I suppose. Still, his red butler smile. No, I haven't been doing much, she replied in an offhanded manner. I go to the pictures, maybe once or two times a week. And I dance every Saturday. No boyfriends, none at all, he asked, his eyebrow arched. I told you, none, she said with a slight shrug. What about you? The girls in England must be lonely with you here and all the boys away in the war. Ah, they're too 
lighting from the lights of me. But you said, I don't know what got into me. So you haven't met anyone else? He shook his head. Then why didn't you answer my letters? Letters? He frowned. What letters? I wondered why I hadn't heard from you. That's why I thought you must have had a, a new boyfriend. I wrote to you every week. You didn't get a single one? No, he paused. It must have been. Oh, it must have been because I changed digs before the old one was bombed. Yes, that must be it. Still, that's a poor excuse for not writing to me. I told you. I thought you'd found someone else. Why do you expect me to write if you've moved and you didn't bother to tell me where you were, she demanded. Becky had my new address. Why didn't you ask her? He demanded in turn. I thought you would. I miss not hearing from you, he added quickly. Happiness surged through her. I didn't like to, she said equally, quietly. You're a funny little thing. He slipped his arms around her. I'll meet you in the barn when the dancing wall really warms up. I want to hear every single thing you've been up to while I'm in the way. I told you I haven't been up to anything, she giggled happily. At first she thought that her period was late because of her particularly bad dose of the flu, but it had never been late before, and there wasn't a soul she could confide in. She became more nervous and more wretched as the weeks dragged by. One Saturday afternoon she went to the public library and what she read made her feel more of wretched. She'd have to see a doctor, but one who didn't know her. She'd come to the telephone directory and settle on a doctor on the north side of the city. But what would she say to him? What would she do? What would Scarlett O'Hara do? Scarlett O'Hara would buy a cheap wedding ring, go to the doctor, say her husband was away fighting in the war, and give the Burns farmers an address. It would be useless writing to Frank, she decided. He still hadn't replied to any of her letters in spite of all his promises to do so. She couldn't go on pretending to the doctor she was married. Besides, there was a baby to think of. She and Frank had to get married. But how would that happen? What would Scarlett O'Hara do? Scarlett O'Hara would go to London, see Frank, and demand he married her. So Muriel told everyone she was going to stay with friends for a couple of weeks. The trembling started once she s stepped onto the mail boat. What if the boat was torpedoed before reaching Hollyhead? Hadn't the Germans tried to sink it only last year? And what about England? Even if she survived the sea journey, she'd be, she'd be blown up by a, to pieces by a bomb. According to the newspapers, the blitz was worse than ever. She tried to see herself as Scarlett O'Hara, riding in a cart, the red butler through the flaming buildings after the bomb. Argument of Atlanta at the at the Yankees, but with a sinking heart, she realised she didn't have Scarlett O'Hara's stamina. Hollyhead was cold and desolate, and the blackout. A deeper depression set in once she boarded the train. Throughout the journey, she was on the alert for the sound of German aircraft, but it was impossible to hear anything other than the shouting and noisy laughter of the sailors mm -hmm. on home. On leave, who crammed the compartments and corridors. Her nerves were shattered, were in shreds, sorry, when she arrived in Plymouth. The destruction was indescribable. Nothing in news reels had prepared her for this. The dust from recently destroyed buildings and the acrid smell of cordite burned the back of her throat. She had an awful job finding Frank's digs, and when she did, the landlady scrutinised her from head to toe, her gaze settling disapprovingly on her stomach. Frank is at the railway yard. He won't be back for till six for his tea, she abruptly informed Muriel. I'll tell him you called, but I'll tell him you called, she repeated before slamming the door. Muriel wandered aimlessly around the ruined city and and then when darkness fell, she waited a few, fell, sorry, she waited a few doors down from Frank's digs. He stopped abruptly when he saw her, before, her running towards him down the deserted street. Are you sure, he demanded. We only did it once. They were sitting in a pub and she was staring at her glass of cider. I was having my period. I never thought. Her words drifted away. 
You never do, that's your trouble. Your head is always in the clouds. It's your fault, she shot back. I was innocent before I met you. You seduced me. Muriel tilted her head high in his scholarly O'Hara dramatic gesture. Seduced you? Don't be daft. Grow up, for God's sake. Look at you. Look at your hair done in that stupid bun. It's not a bun. It's a, it's a chignon. And that silly frock you've got on, he continued more hastily than before. Nobody wears silly frocks like that these days. Listen, Muriel, and listen to me good. You're not scholarly O'Hara. And we're not living there on, on a cinema screen. We're living up here in the real world. My best mate was killed last night. He took a deep, deep swag of beer. Sorry, she murmured. I meant, I'm sorry about your friend. Frank straightened up determinedly in the chair. All right, we'll get married, he said. But what then? Do we get a big flat in New York? Do I get a fancy job in, in a fancy bank? And we live happily ever after? Is that what you have in mind? For once she was lost for words. I'll see if my landlady will take you in for the night. I won't stay, stay in your digs, she said, determined. I wasn't suggesting an, anything, he said, equally determined. Get me a place somewhere else. Stay here while I have a word with the barman. There won't be an air raid tonight, will there? She asked suddenly. How the hell do I know? The room was damp and grubby. Muriel sat on the bed trying not to cry. Frank had agreed to marry her, but the question was, that preyed on her mind now was, did she want to marry him and spend the rest of her life in England? What was she going to do? What was Scarlett O'Hara do? Muriel flung her handbag at the wall to blazes with Scarlett O'Hara and that damn film. Frank was right. She wasn't living in the real world. What was she, Muriel Davis, going to do? Muriel Davis would marry Frank and go back to Dublin as the war was over. It was the baby that mattered now. <laughs> okay. Now, that's the end of, that's the end of the short story, actually. <laughs> okay, take care. Bye.